So Tom, it's nice to see you. I was going to say back in Plymouth, but uh, you're, you're Plymouth born and bred, so... You're... I wasn't born here, but, sure. I, but I absolutely grew up here, yeah. I, grew, I lived here till I was 18. I've never missed a Christmas in Plymouth. Right. But the, the sun's out for you today, so yeah. that is extraordinary. <laughs> but, but you're here to give this, this talk, and, um, and one of the interesting... The key thing is this, this dilemma, this political challenge we've got for the 21st century between the, this uh, prosperity, security and stability. Do you want to talk us through that? Yeah, I think what, what people have not realised in a way is the extent to which the uh, environment and the natural resources underpin the economy. Yeah. So if you don't take care of your natural resources, retain their productivity, mm. you undermine the ability of the uh, economy to deliver against people's expectations. Mm. Well, you've now got a world in which we've got, um, what, now close to 8 billion people now. Uh, when I was born, there were 2.5 billion yeah. on the planet. Uh, by the middle of the century, there'll be 10 billion. And what's more, it's a much more connected world. It's a much, a really hyper-connected world. So everybody can see... What everybody, each other's got, yeah. What everybody else has got, exactly right. And so... You know, people, the, one of the first bits of anything that people spend money on all over the world now is a phone. And they can see it. So people see how we're living and want to live like that. That expectations that are coming from yeah. developing countries. Well, it's from, yes. So people's expectations are rising. The number of people are rising. We're not doing a good job of maintaining the productivity of that natural resource base. And what's more, people are moving into the cities. Yeah in massive amounts. It's now about half the uh, world's population live in urban areas. By the middle of the century, it'll be three quarters. Now, the thing about failing to meet expectations in cities is politically very dangerous, because if you do that long enough, people really get cross and then they rebel because they're organisable. If life gets bad for people in rural areas, poor people, indigenous peoples, uh, uh, subsistence farmers, coastal fishermen, they either move or they die. And we've seen far too much of that on television anyway. But when people have their expectations defeated and disappointed in urban areas, they tend to get very cross and riot. And we've seen lots of signs of that. And that, of course, is a breeding ground for ISIS, Al-Qaeda, for any kind of, of, of political insurgency movement, breeds on those disappointments. So it's a world that's getting very dangerous structurally. You talk about the world in motion. I mean, people in motion, movement, yeah. you, your city, your rural to, to city, but also, you know, within countries as well. We're seeing a lot of the, the people moving around. With... Well, we, we tend to be a bit obsessive in this country about <laughs> people moving between countries. Yeah. Actually, the major movements currently within. are within countries, within big countries. You've got massive movements of people into the cities. Um, but if you go back to what I was saying a moment ago, people can see what it's like living here. Mm. Now, you, we're human beings, right? We're sentient beings. Yeah. If we see something that is better than where we are, we, want it. we move, well, yeah, we, yeah. We, we move, we do what every living thing yeah, does. Yeah, yeah. We move towards the place where it's better. Uh, and so we have got to think through much more uh, clearly than we've done now, whether if we're not prepared to have the people move here, what are we prepared to do to make life worthwhile there? And that means maintaining both the social conditions, so better governance, so they're not abused, they're not in conflict zones, but also being prepared to contribute to maintaining the environmental conditions, which make those places attractive. And you, it, it seems to me that you are particularly focused on those natural environmental conditions, you know, that, the natural capital, essentially, that in those areas. Yeah, I mean, we, um, you know, we've tended to, think of and to some extent uh, we've presented the environment as a sort of optional extra. Let's get rich and then we can take care of the environment. And that really, really misunderstands the extent to which the environment matters to us. There are six, maybe seven uh, kind of biological, ecological areas that provide everything in our economy that isn't provided by fossil fuels and non-fossil minerals. Croplands, rangelands, uh, um, <coughs> grasslands, freshwaters, oceans, the atmosphere. Uh, they provide the everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
They pro all, everything we use that makes life worth living comes either from fossil fuels and non-fossil minerals or from those uh, uh, ecosystems. And if we lower the productivity of those ecosystems, we lower the productivity of the economy. But we've not, we've not really understood that. Now you can go, you can go to uh, an old Rothschild uh, estate in uh, East Anglia and you can see a pole that at the end of the 19th century was, was placed there uh, and it, it was driven into the ground. It's now about 18 foot uh, above the ground and that's the soil loss. And that's a very visual way of thinking. Now we've done that on everything, not just on soil. We've done that, we've done that in the way we put plastics into the sea, very fashionable right now, but we've done that in the way we put nitrates into water supplies, creating dead zones all over uh, the world. In all sorts of ways, we've simply not bothered to maintain the productivity. Because as I say, we keep thinking the environment is something nice that you have when you've got other things that you need. So we've mislocated the environment in our priorities. So I mean, within the environmental community, this is pretty well known, and I guess within the scientific environmental one too, but you know, you talk a lot to politicians and business leaders. Do they get it? I guess some do, but the vast majority of them. I don't think any of the political parties, possible exception of the Green Party, have had a discussion, a political discussion, about where the environment fits in terms of the promises they're trying to offer people. Uh, at all, I think we've had a very bad response politically. As I say, people have tended to see this as a economic issue, as a marginal issue, not as an issue that threatens, if we get it wrong, yeah. to undermine prosperity and security. Now, to some extent, environmentalists have been responsible for that a bit, part of the responsibility for that. I mean, you can you can talk about um, uh, air pollution, vehicle pollution, you can talk about that as a bad thing because it's pollution. Yeah. Or you can talk about that as a way of wrecking the health service because we spend 15 billion pounds a year in the health service on dealing with the problems created by uh, basically vehicle exhaust pollution. Uh, you can um, talk about uh, energy efficiency, the need to get carbon emissions down. You can talk about that as the thing we've got to do to stay below two degrees, which is fairly meaningless to most people. Or you can talk about the fact that everything you want to do about that will get people's energy yeah. bills down. You know, so we've so been it's the framing, the framing yeah, of these discussions. We've been very bad at framing them in a way that makes them accessible to politicians. And in terms of the the financial system, you, you, you talk a lot about the systemic risk, for example, in the yeah. financial system. Is that kind of global capitalist system? Do you see that? It's, it's clearly part of the problem. Is it part of the solution for you? Do you well, see a solution there? Uh, well, what, what you see happening is very interesting now. You see, you see the people who are much more concerned than political leaders about uh, say the risk of climate change are central bankers yeah. and uh, the large scale financial asset managers yeah. because they realize that the economy is at risk yeah. if we don't manage the, 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 the problem of climate change. Now, you've also got tremendous amount of um, drive from technology, from opportunity seekers, from people coming up with low carbon um, technologies. And there's an interesting sort of push on from those technology in, because that lowers the political risk of doing something about climate. Uh, but you also need the politicians to understand that if they move policy forward, they create a pull for those technologies and to bring them forward faster. Now, currently, we're not going to we're not going to maintain a stable. What we're doing now is not enough to maintain a stable climate. Paris put us on the right road but we're not going down it far enough or fast enough yet. I was going to ask you about Paris and there's other, you know, these kind of, these political landmark strategic frameworks, the, you know, the Sendai, Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction and the sustainable development goals. And, the, and I wondered, you might, in terms of the academic institutions, you know, universities like this, what do you think the role is there? Because we've kind of been doing our own yeah. thing. Do you think there's a place for institutions? Because it's a big, complicated... You have to, you have to shoot the peer review police. <laughs> uh, if you want the universities to play the part they could play. Yeah. Because, I and mean, it was Karl Popper, who's probably one of the biggest influential, intellectual influences on my life,
who really so is that the point is you have problems what you need from from scholars from academics is people who uh, want to solve problems yeah. well problems don't give a damn about <laughs> disciplinary ba boundaries they really don't and you can't solve a lot of these problems without integrating knowledge about science knowledge about engineering knowledge about the law knowledge about uh, uh, communities uh, people you really have got to go where the problem takes you and we're very bad at that we're very bad at that the way we fund universities doesn't help because we tend to do it all in these pillars and what governments increasingly need governments are bad at but increasingly need to come out of universities are really integrated solutions to these problems because they're horizontal they're not in pillars so are you optimistic or pessimistic I mean looking ahead what's your, your I get asked this I get asked I this question really, yeah. a lot uh, and I point out optimism is a function of your temperament uh, and not your analysis. I mean, my mm -hmm. temperament is optimistic. I, am, I think people are brilliant. And I look at what people do in this country. I look at the way they reacted to crisis like uh, the bomb in yeah. uh, Manchester yeah. or yeah. when there's an appeal. You know, people who've not got a, um, uh, had a pay rise for a decade Nevertheless, when they get asked to cough up as an earthquake in Nepal or something, sure. you know, they cough up millions of pounds. So there's nothing wrong with the people, and that's a source of great optimism. Uh, but, you know, my ana analysis is life is, life is going to get... I wouldn't be under 40, really. Life is, is going to get very tough unless we do a lot more to crack these problems. Unless young people uh, get out there and vote. Right. I mean, I think that really matters. And we have saw that on Brexit where and that last uh, the last election where actually young people beginning to turn out and vote a bit more mm. really began to make a difference they can't count on old people taking care of their environmental future they really need to get out there and vote yeah we often keep on talking about this next generation be the critical one and then often the reply to me is well why don't you old ones fix it first because it was on your watch it happened. yeah yeah so, i know that so we need to kind of do that <laughs> i think i remember going doing that circuit the real thing i mean look my point is not that, not, my point is that don't count on us. Yeah. We ain't going to do it for we you. We haven't done very well so far. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, all of the stuff said is, is true. You know, we had, we, we've had the cheap money to buy houses. We had the cheap houses. We had the cheap education. Yeah, yeah. We had a really good time. Yeah. Uh, you know, life is, is already much harder. Uh, and that's partly, that's partly, that's, that's not our fault that life is much harder. It's partly because people are not paying enough attention to political choices and not getting engaged in politics. And we've made an awful lot, parties of left and right, made an awful lot of bad decisions. Well, I hope you can enthuse and inspire some of those young ones that's going to be in there tonight. So thanks for that, Tom. A oh, pleasure.